let's say you have um, a web server and you need users to be able to access the web server from uh, the outside. So in that case, you need to do a virtual IP. So we call it VIP. So in, with the virtual IP, you define, you know, um, so you put the name, you define what the public IP is that users will be connecting to. So this is more like a destination app. So you define what the public IP user will be connecting to, then you define what the real IP on the server is. Now, there are times you want to do port forwarding, then you, you can also do that. So for TCP, you can now say, okay, users are connecting to port uh, 10 to 5, but internally is port 25, which is email. You know, so you can do all of that you know, from here. So when you do this, in fact, let's let's create something. So let's say test VIP, for example. Uh, so we can say the public IP is 111. Then the IP on the server is 10.111. OK, we're not really in port forwarding. So we say OK. So then we have our test VIP here. So that means that on the internet, people will connect to 111, but then that traffic goes to uh, 10.1.1.1. So in create a, creating a policy for access, so if that's a web service, so I'll say my incoming interface will be the one interface, which is the interface facing the internet. Uh, and then my outgoing interface would be um, wherever. So let's just say it's on the internet interface. So the source now will be the internet, which is it could be anything, or I could restrict it to if I know the IP of who needs to connect from the internet. Then instead of addresses, I'm going to go to virtual IPs, right? So which is test VIP. So what will happen there is now because it's a VIP, when people connect to 111, it translates it to 10 the 111. So now if I enable NAT. What that means is the user that is connecting from the internet, his own IP will be translated. So but I don't want that to happen. So I'll disable NAT because I want to see the real IP of the guy connecting. So remember, the NAT within the policy itself is source NAT. And because this traffic is coming from the internet you know, to my network, the source is the IP address on the internet. You know, then. So if it's a web service, for example, I can do WAF. To be able to do WAF, I need to change to proxy mode, for example. Then I can enable, you know, WAF. So if you click on this, then you begin to see what the WAF can do. So you begin to look at SSL injection, you know, some of this cross-site scripting. So I can enable. Uh, okay, so I can enable this. If I want to block, I can say block. You know, and say okay. So so I can configure the WAF as I want. So, but what now begins to happen is it now begins to apply that profile on the traffic. Do I've allowed the guy to come in? Then I'm, you know, beyond allowing the guy to come in on on uh, port. Okay, so that means um, the service. I need to specify the service. So it might be web. Uh, where's my web? Okay, so it might be HTTPS, for example. So for this or HTTP, anyone. So for this, I'm now applying WAF on, on that traffic. So if it's HTTPS, I need to now do SSL, you know, deep inspection to be able to, for this WAF to work. You understand? Otherwise, the WAF will not work because the traffic is encrypted from the guy connecting to the server itself. So those, those are very, very important things. Um, but for 40 gates, um, one thing with servers is that we can actually create a load balancer. If you have multiple servers behind, you can create a load balancer and then have, so you could have um, the HTTP connections with load balancer, then have, you know, um, the traffic inspected, then, you know, every other thing goes back end from FortiGate to the servers behind. So those are key things um, that you can do. So login also, yeah, so you can log all session, you know, if you want to capture packet as well, you can capture packet, 